All right, Warren. So what I did was I, I took some points and then I just put everything in a paragraph format. So I'm just going to be reading. Okay. Um, in his outline, um, this is my thoughts and comments. In his outline, we came across his beliefs from the get go, and we get to see what he's about. His second statement in the outline was that people became who they are on the basis of what they do on a daily on a daily to sur to survive. What this means is that you are what you do, or eventually it places a strong influence on your character and your belief to the point it becomes your way of life. He says that we as human beings are born blank, and we and what we become is dependent on your environment and what we do in it. Our genetics is not, not the main reason we are who we are, but the socioeconomical status that we are born in and the position in which we, are, we stand in said status. Marx is familiar with the works of other philosophers to the point where he, he takes apart their works and completely disagrees with some of them. Um, Locke, Mill, Hobbes, just to name a few. Um, the view that Locke has that we are all born free and equal, Marx completely disagrees with that. He says, we are not born equal, but we are social and dependent individuals. To me, I would somewhat agree with this to the extent at which everyone is born, but not everyone is born freely. There are parts in the world where children, even before they are born, are claimed for different purposes, whether it be for war, work, or marriage, while some others are born with within a care without a care in the world and go about their lives freely as they please and choose the path that they wish to travel in their lives. Um, Marx has the belief that we as humans are molded by society, which goes against the belief of male. I believe that this is completely true. Uh, the society in which we are born in has everything to do with the way we, way we think and how we go about things in our life on a daily basis. If you know that you live in a violent area where at night the crime is the worst, you are definitely not going to go grocery shopping when it's dark or go on a casual walk hoping that you will be safe. It will become the norm for you to get what you need done before it gets dark. And ultimately that will become who you are and it shapes your behavior as well. So that's what I had. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So. I think he would go further, sort of um, how you understand religion or not. Yes. Um, how you understand uh, what's respectful behavior or not. How much uh, authority you think children need and how much you think they naturally desire what's good and you just sort of are like a gardener <laughs> nurturing them. Um, what um, how you see yourself socially in relation to other people, um, what kind of job you anticipate getting, right? Um, what sort of education you think you deserve. Uh, I mean, everything, right? The whole way your mind works, your desires. Um, does that make sense to you, all of you? Yes. Okay, so usually I ask these questions. How many of you think economics affects the way you think? How many of you think Americans think uh, you can buy happiness? What does it mean to live in a good neighborhood, right? Um, uh, how, what about why do we call some countries developed and some developing? Well, mm -hmm. is that because of economics, right? Capitalism. Certainly, I think that's a really misnomer because America, I think, is underdeveloped culturally and emotionally, uh, but highly developed, you know, in terms of material goods. It's also underdeveloped in terms of creating a middle class because it's shrinking the middle class. And that a sign of a higher, more socially evolved society is that it has a middle class. But that's not the way we use the words, right? We use developed and developing. And that's all based on, you know what? <laughs> the good old greenback. Um, does that make sense to you, Ivy? You should unmute. Can you hear us, Ivy? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, does that make sense to you all? Yes. We're yes. saying we are who we are based on uh, our experiences. Correct? Well, specifically with the economic system, right? It's economic determinism. It's not just any old determinism. Um, so for example, you could say, well, I got molded by my family because my dad was gone half the time at business and my mother ran the family and we, my, we had our house in Vail, Colorado to go skiing because that was our family time. And you know, that's what I think life is. Now, is that what life is? No, <laughs> you know, that's because of your position in the economic system that you think that's second nature, right? Um, somebody else grew up thinking everybody grows up poor, right? Everybody uh, has certain meals they have to skip every week because there isn't enough food. I mean, <laughs> you know, that that's that's what Marx emphasized, that it's economics that really affects your hopes, your fears, your fantasies, mm -hmm. everything. Um, so let me start with um, Marx on the USA. What would he say about us? Okay, we have the blank slate, we have alienated labor. Workers never get paid for the value of their labor because the capitalist takes it. Oh, we've got everybody. All right, good. Sorry, I'm so late. All right, good. Okay, so this outline is what would Mark say about us? That we are definitely driven by capitalism. Our consciousness is, and our understanding of rights is totally, all it, all it is is about uh, the right to free trade. Freedom is just about money and everything else is about money. Um, for example, the family, why do we have this nuclear family? Well, so it can move around when the capitalist tells you you get a different job, right? You gotta be really mobile in a capitalist society. And, uh, you know, traditional societies, people owned a plot of land and for hundreds of years, the families was there. They passed it on. Okay. So anyway, we went through that. I hope you understand that we are considered the ultimate capitalist mindset of all the countries in the world. Um, but what about the switch to high tech? Marx was wrong in the sense that industrial capitalism was not the end of history. We have computers and technology are the next wave. If you use a Marxist analysis, however, you say the technological era has created a new economic base and new relations between people and between nations. So why do we have women's rights, gay and lesbian rights, environmental protection, the use of science combined with more and more information? Um, why do we have women's rights? Well, it's not because we really care. <laughs> it's because women are equally competitive in the market when it's a tech, high tech. So some <laughs> SOB head of a corporation, he's, you know, he has, what, however many sex partners he has, no, he thinks of women as an, as an object, but he knows in his company, they are really good computer programmers, high tech. So yeah, women's rights, let's have equality mm -hmm. for women because I'll make more money that way, right? Same with gay rights. All it is, are they good at making money for me? Yes, okay, give them rights. What do I care? <laughs> All right, so the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights um, are political values motivated by the desire for capitalist entrepreneurs. So when the UN was founded in 1945 in the US, 
it was trying to link together Marxism and, and uh, Locke, the West and the East. And I can't go through it, but if you want to read the list of rights from number one to 21, they're very Western and 22 to 27 is, is a right to a job, a right to healthcare, a right to leisure time, right? That's where the government has to get it, come in and give you jobs, right? And so you, you tax people a lot more than we're taxed. And then everybody gets these services because they think you have a right to it, right? whereas we're the individual rights types. Um, okay, so what happened was when the workers took over, as a matter of fact, um, Marx talks about the temporary dictatorship of the proletariat. They're gonna temporarily take over and then they're gonna distribute power because they know, you know they got abused and they're not gonna abuse other people. That did not happen, <laughs> okay. But um, the Marxism is, it still has appeal in developing nations because they're so exploited by the US and other capitalist countries. Their resources are being exploited. So when they read the Marxist manifesto, it makes sense to them, right? Um, okay, so let's see. Um, sometimes, okay, so all this stuff is going on economically, and you can analyze it, the global political situation, in terms of capitalism, but also late stage capitalism. The capitalism is starting to destroy itself, partly because fossil fuel billionaires have gotten control of the system and the envi natural environment is deteriorating. So it's starting to destroy itself, just like it did back um, in feudalism. The, the, originally the money was centralized in land in the guy who owned the land, the estate owner. But then with industry, the, you know, the people, the shopkeepers in the town started selling plows, and they started selling more and more stuff with more and more knowledge, scientific knowledge, industry. So eventually they became more economically powerful. And then there was this huge overthrow, right? And so now capitalism, the city folks with their shops selling goods, um, they are starting to feed, you know, they become so powerful, they exploit everything. They're exploiting all the people. They're exploiting nature to the point where it's going to self-destruct and there's going to be another overthrow and we're going to change. Um, the thing about uh, Marx is that he thought it would be the end of history because we'd have this industrial economy where people could change jobs. That's not true. We have a high tech, so we have more and more education, more and more interdependence. But you still can use, um, it's still uh, worthy of looking at capitalism as self-destructing because so the, the money has gotten into the hands of so few people that um, everybody else is waking up and realizing that this just can't keep going on. Um, let's see. Um, capitalism creates a world in its own image. Okay. Um, every human being, it turns every activity into a commodity. Let me just give you an example. Um, okay, communism didn't work. Oh gosh, these, these outlines. I think they're all interesting, but we just don't have time. So let me give you an example of how capitalism commodifies everything, all right? So what this means is that when money sticks to money, people will do anything to get money. Well, what works in terms of food, right? 
We have to have food. Oh, okay. Our taste buds are through evolution. We are drawn to sugar and salt um, and fat because we needed that to survive. What do capitalists do? They create processed sugar that our taste buds react to, right? But that's really unhealthy and really unnatural and it's addictive, right? And then we have these polyunsaturated fats that are really unnatural and they're really horrible. So capitalists exploit your body. They exploit your taste buds. They make you addicted to this fake food and you get obese. And then all these other people make money off of your obesity and you get heart disease and you get diabetes and everybody's making money. So your body is being exploited for <laughs> greed, right? That's where you're made into a commodity. The next level is that your brain, right? Your mental health is being made into a commodity, okay? Like you're set up, you have all these advertising, fantasizing about the house in the suburbs. And so you're going to have the house in the burbs. And it's like, that's, you keep running into obstacles, right? Blaming yourself, trying, trying. Or you think if you buy this product, you'll be beautiful and some guy will be attracted to you and that's all you want in life. And all that advertising makes you internally conflicted. And so if you get depressed because life isn't like the fantasy, oh, well, we have a drug for that, right? And so your mental health is being exploited for wealth. Mm -hmm. You're just a commodity, right? Um, all right. So that's what capitalism does. And in the late stage, you're exploiting the natural world and actually destroying, you know, we're going to have more and more um, climate catastrophes, right? They're starting to cost insurance companies tons of money. Insurance companies are going bankrupt, but the few at the top are still getting richer. The Koch brothers, right? The fossil fuel billionaires are getting richer. It doesn't matter. The insurance companies go. It doesn't matter. Everybody else is sort of falling apart. It's okay. Um, so the natural world is being destroyed and all, you know, all sorts of businesses related to that. But hey, we'll get new businesses. We'll, somebody's going to make billions on gas masks or something like that. Um, people are being exploited, right? So how many, you know, we're going to get to the point um, in military recruiting, there's some huge percentage of people that sign up to fight our wars for oil who are too obese, they don't qualify. So we won't even have enough soldiers to fight our wars for oil because they're so out of shape or mentally ill. And you know, if you have too many mentally ill people who are on disability, you don't have any employees. So it's just, that's the self-destructive nature of it. And maybe somebody will catch on that this is not working very well. Um, and maybe we'll have some kind of a blowback. I don't know, because it hasn't happened yet. And it doesn't look like it's going to happen on the next round of elections. I just like, anyway. Um, all right, so let me go back to the outlines. Um, let's see, the religion. This is where during my, while I was growing up, it was Marx is, is an atheist, right? And Mr. Huckabee, there still are plenty of politicians that still get a lot of mileage. Oh, that's atheism. That's the abyss of socialism because it's atheism. Well, let's look at what Marx meant, right? He said, religious suffering. When you find religion in a society, you know that there's alienated labor because people are alienated from their humanity. So the only way they can get in touch with their humanity is to project heaven. You know, I'll endure all of this. If I behave myself, I can go to heaven. Heaven is where they have their humanity. Religious suffering is the expression of real suffering and a protest against it. It's the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world the soul of soulless conditions. It's the opiate of the people. You just give them this drug and they'll behave. 
Uh, the abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions is to call on, on them to give up a condition that requires illusions, right? Does everybody understand that, that that's not, oh, atheism, oh, <laughs> it's just. Yeah, I, it, um, I thought it was interesting that, uh, at least I think it was Marx, was kind of saying that the society or the economy or whatever was telling us what humanity was instead of letting us live our own humanity like we had to get to where we were willing to i don't know accept what society said was normal or good as opposed society, to society society is the ruling class right yeah, yeah the ideas of any society are the ideas of the ruling class right so so aristotle this golden mean right you have the mean between extremes. Oh, and those poor people, they just don't eat right, right? They don't eat the right thing for the right reason in the right way. So they're not, you know, they're not as cultivated. And, and you know, Marx is going to go, hello, if they had some food, I think they would. <laughs> or even right now in our society, people with more money can eat healthy because they can afford it. And so that there's um, uh, government subsidies for corn so that corn syrup is cheap. And you can't, then you, you know, the rich can't say, oh, those, why do those working class people eat that junky food and they get diabetes? And well, look at the prices, guys. <laughs> it's so much cheaper. And so you can't judge people. They're just trying to get by on their salaries. But that's how it works, right? You could say those people don't know how to eat. It's all their fault, blah, blah. When actually you've set up an economic system where it's the only way they can not be hungry all the time. Um, it's, does that make sense, Alicia? Too much sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes, yeah, okay. For example, I went to Kroger last night and I got stuff to make um, a big chef salad you know, with boiled eggs and cheese and pepperoni, ham, $52 for a family to eat salad for dinner. It, and it's, that's ridiculous. So it's just awful. And you could go to McDonald's and pay a couple bucks for the same number of calories. Yep. It, I mean, it is an absolute setup. And I went to the grocery store the other day and I spend a lot of money on food. And I didn't used to but I do because it's an investment, you know, in my health. But I mean, I'm very aware of this and it is, it is horrible. Um, so, but it's typical, Marx would say, late stage capitalism. And then, and then the wealthy get to say, oh, those working class, it's all their fault. You know, that's why they're contributing to our debt because they have all these health problems and then they get on this government health care and it's all their fault and you know i'm not paying my taxes i'm not paying for my hard earned money to pay for them because they don't know how to eat yeah that was another thought i had you know these these overweight people who have to have special treatment for diabetes or heart conditions or back problems just because they're too heavy and that's their fault and they should have to pay they should have to take care of that themselves yeah well the food they eat costs one-fifth as much as healthy food would cost i mean it is it has really gotten really bad um and and our healthcare system is so awful right it isn't anything to do with prevention because again, it's enabling this to happen because a lot of other rich people are making a lot of money, right? <laughs> doctors and whatever. And so if you tried to have programs to prevent it, oh, well, I'm not going to make my money. You know, the heart doctor is, I guess the biggest house in Batesville is owned by a heart doctor. Goody, goody, people have heart disease, you know, it's just awful. Um, 
Warren, does that make sense to you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and so the politicians, you know, the Democrats would much prefer prevention. They're really, they're into prevention, public, but they can't, right? Because we're so much into survival, especially lately, that, uh, you know, it all it is is should we have a CARES Act so people don't end up on the street? Uh, and should we give money to get people vaccinated? Or should we say, no, no, you know, you should make enough money, pay for your own vaccine. Or, you know, how come you can't pay for your rent? That's on you, you didn't work hard enough, right? Uh, yeah, that's where we're at. We're just at a pretty low stage of late stage capitalism. Um, anyway, let's see. How Wall Street, this is this all stuff is is all related. That how would how do we have that economic collapse? Well, look at what's going on in the business schools. Look at what people are being trained to think is cost benefit to be these economic actors. Remember Locke calculating the most efficient means to your own economic self-interest and over specialization. Then there's has neoliberalism, minimal government turned us into psychopaths, right? It really, um, the people who succeed in that kind of a heartless uh, situation are psychopaths. Like they don't care about other people. And that, you know, feeds their calculation of their most, most efficient means to their own economic self interest. But it, you know, it leads to everybody else being destroyed. I mean, you cannot have a decent society unless you identify with other people and you think of them as people, not commodities. But we are reinforcing it. We even believe in it. We teach it in our business schools. Um, all right, so this is a good example of, this was the head of the Czech Republic. And he here's quotes from Marx, um, abolition of private property. And that was so outrageous to the Lockeans, right? That property, you know, whose property? All it is is what do you mean by private property? It, the wage labor doesn't create any property. The, the workers labor doesn't create property for the workers. It creates capital for the owner. The average, okay, the abolition of this is called individuality and freedom. Oh, all it is is the bourgeois individuality, right? For the people, the haves, <laughs> there's no individuality for the workers who work 18 hours a day in the coal mine. It, bourgeois independence, not worker independence. Bourgeois freedom, not worker freedom. Um, you say it will, individuality will vanish under communism. Well, that's just the individuality, the bourgeois, the owners, that's not people. We're trying to give to people, give people, the workers, a life. They can have a house, a car, you know, they have their basic needs met and they can have their humanity. They're not being exploited, right? All the crap about the family, it's just an economic unit to pass your wealth down, that workers don't have families, they have to work all the time, they never have any time for family. Okay, that's Marx. Now Havel said, there was a time when for a generation, the word socialism was a synonym for a just world, right? For redistributing wealth. Um, then, the people, power hungry people at the top use that word to get the trust of the masses and then they just kept the money for themselves. So he just talks about how these words, they meant one thing and then they meant another thing. And the same thing happens with luck and freedom, right? Originally, when we, you know, Europeans came over here and they got their 40 acres, freedom and keep the government out of my life meant one thing. Now it's totally different. We have this international capitalism. So 
one purpose of political philosophy of studying liberal arts is to learn to distrust words, learn to look under the words. <laughs> what are they doing? Don't look at what they're saying, look at what they're doing. And that's part of um, being an educated person. So I did want you to keep that in mind. And here's the Koch brothers, right? They're spending even more now. They have a plant in Arkansas. They have a super majority in the legislature and they are passing. It's a, it's a billionaire boys club. They pass whatever laws they want. I've stopped following it because it's just too awful. Um, we have the Waltons, the Walmart and Koch brothers together. It's just, it's too discouraging. And it always is whitewashed with, oh, you can't, you can't teach the 1619 project, you know, don't get those liberals forcing my kids to read this stuff about diversity or racism. That that's the next election is focusing on that because it works. That's why, just because it works. And the Koch brothers get richer and richer and all these other guys. Um, all right, so let's see, I had nine pages that just, again, it just describes the centralization of wealth. And this is the alternative, is taking responsibility for the commons, right? That the common good matters. Capital, yeah. The traditional definition of capitalism as a system that works when everybody pursues their individual self-interest is broken down. It's not moving anybody forward except a few people. It's moving a few people. Um, and then you have this, again, another article about the mental, how these people think, and it's not, it's just not healthy. Um, then I had my reading book uh, group, the book list, and I have a couple things here. This is so important about the whole history of housing for African-Americans. Um, originalism is capitalist. Uh, evil genius is about the shrinking middle class. Twilighted democracy is about how in Eastern Europe, how we're losing democracies to authoritarianism. Um, Coke land is about the Koch brothers. Uh, the dark side is about our, um, our torture program, 350 pages. And then um, uh, actually there was another one called um, Dark Money, and that's about the Koch brothers. Then I did uh, sustainability, that's a big one for me. Uh, let's see, how to avoid climate disaster. Merchants of Doubt, why it is people still doubt it? That was a longstanding tradition. Um, let's see, um, The Imposters is about um, people that Trump put on his cabinet. Five of them are billionaires. He's just a rich capitalist talking about how much he cares about the people. And then when he gets elected, he gives all the power to his rich buddies and they use it to get richer. Um, this one is about trying to break down monopolies. This one is about the people that Trump put in power and their backgrounds and what they do with the power when they have it. Incidentally, they just destroy our environment. They work for the anti-environment corporations. Ron, Zilke does also. She is a rich billionaire who just destroying the public schools. Um, this is the one about uh, the, the food industry destroying our bodies. Um, what universities owe democracy, which is important. I think colleges are the place to go to think about this stuff. Um, so those are some of the books that I read and you can get excerpts if you want, but I would never force you, students have to ask. All right, now relativism. Okay, we're gonna have to do this on Monday. We're just gonna be behind. Um, again, I don't like talking that much, but I just, we're just behind and I, okay. 
I want you to go through, I hope you've read the article, but what does she think is real? She's studying uh, social groups. She's studying behaviors. Why does she think it's important? She goes on to these isolated islands because they have a coherent, internally consistent set of values. It's an alternative to American mass culture. Her conclusion is you would be a different person if you lived in those places. Morality differs. It's a convenient term for socially approved habits. What are the examples she used? Homosexuality, mystic trance, and the certain kind of head hunt, paranoia in Melanesia and head hunting. Okay, the examples are, they contradict Western values. They aren't just different. What does she think we can learn? People are molded by cultural norms. Western values are no better. If we lived there, we'd have those values. We would be different. There's no reason for cultural selection. Morality means normality, okay? She's against a false sense of inevitability, cultural bigotry. Why does she think it's harmful? Westerners have tried to force their values onto people. Does, she mean, does this mean she has a non-relative value? Yeah, tolerance is better than bigotry. Okay, all right. And she thinks her research is gonna improve the human condition by making Westerners aware of their bias, the scientific investigation of other cultures, and she's telling the whole truth and that will improve everybody because bigotry is bad. Um, I'm gonna whip through this and you can, we can go through it again, but this will be the main thing for Monday. I am going to post the stuff that I had for next week, and um, we're just going to see. I'll, I'll put on the stream exactly what I want you to read. I want you to read all, all four of the attachments on this uh, post, a stream but only the first 14 pages of the 31 page post. Okay, what are the universal problems with which a culture has to deal? Survival, family life, shelter, sexuality, every culture has to deal with all that stuff because it's the human condition. What are the specific objective problems to which mystic trance homosexuality, paranoia, and headhunting are a response. While mystic trance is religious expression, every society deals with that. Homosexuality, sexuality, paranoia had to do with their survival, and the headhunting had to do with grief. Are there these specific responses entirely non-rational? This is where I disagree with her. There's a reason why. The, these societies would evolve those norms, right? That's my disagreement. And she also says there's temperament types. Is the purpose of society to meet human needs and realize human potential? Or is it just to get people to conform so that you have an agreed upon set of values, right? She said they have an internally consistent set of values and that's great. It's a coherent society. Well, what's the purpose of society? What's a good society? Well integrated and consistent? Is that a good society? That's what she says. Now, um, what are problems? Okay, her member, her, a good society is well integrated and consistent with itself according to the values it's selected. Remember that. All right. What's her conclusion? Morality differs. It just means a convenient, socially approved. There's no reason for cultural selection. It's just that once you select, you want a coherent set of values, right? It's based on data. How does the human mind think? Well, you observe things and you draw a conclusion, right? So a kid observes somebody, they imitate the behavior, they you know, ask questions, their parents explain to them what they need to do and why. 
They generalize, okay, this is a situation like that. They imitate, they, okay, that's how the human mind thinks, habit imitation. What sorts of non-inductive thinking does Benedict think is impossible, okay? Aristotle's thinking, his model of flourishing is not just based on observation. Most societies are not like that. They don't flourish. They have this class split. So he has a model based on biology, but not based on observation. Augustine has a model not based on observation, right? It's based on faith, um, the eternal and the temporal, free will, sin and grace, salvation and damnation, right? This is where Karl Marx says, it's all economics, guys. That's the opiate, right? That's what Marx says, an opiate. Um, what does Aquinas say? He unites Aristotle and Aquinas. So he had this other world view. Try to remember this, you guys, because you all liked it at the time, right? Kant was formulating moral laws and then Locke that were born free and equal. Those are not the kind of thinking where you're just observing stuff. What kind of thinking does she think is impossible? John Stuart Mill, um, higher and lower pleasures, right? He agrees with her that we are the result of conditioning, but she totally disagrees that there are higher and lower pleasures. It's like, Mr. Mill, you're a Victorian, a British guy during the Victorian area. That's why you think that. Okay. In questions of good and evil, people can only describe their, their experience in a social group. So why do you believe in eternal life, salvation? Because people told you your social group growing up as a kid and your survival depended on you believing that. All the behaviors are motivated by those beliefs and you learn through imitation that you that's the way to go. That's the truth. Okay, if she's correct, in number six, in the question, socializations mean people are born into social groups and they adapt. If she's right, then what characteristics make the must the best societies possess? They select for character traits that reinforce each other. They maintain the same values from one generation to the next, and they're coherent and internally consistent. Everybody's comfortable with this. They don't question it. And that was true of all those societies she studied. If she's correct, what will destroy a society? Change, interaction with other groups, introducing new behaviors and beliefs so the experiences of the new generation are unintelligible to the previous generation. You know, they're going to undermine coherence introducing beliefs and behaviors that conflict with the traditional ones. So the new generation has to reject the old. Introducing these behaviors without calling them morally good, but just different. So there's no foundation for morality. Given her view, her view, <laughs> if she really wanted to strengthen Western society, what would she do? She would say, um, I went out and studied these, boy, they are inferior. I came home and I was so glad I grew up in the West because we are superior. They're really backward and we're really forward, right? That would be her way of reinforcing Western values. And, you know, we're coherent, we're internally consistent with ourselves, right? That's what she would do if she wanted to strengthen her society. What if she wanted to weaken our society, right? Make it internally inconsistent and coherent, what would she do? She would force Westerners to recognize other cultures as different but equally valuable, say that people are plastic. Un, you know, there is no truth. There isn't everything you thought was good is just relative. So get over it that undermines our cultural integrity, right? We don't have any coherence or consistency. We're doubting ourselves. She, so she, on her own view, 
of a good society is internally consistent and coherent, she is doing exactly the opposite of that. She thinks she's improving things because she wants to get rid of bigotry, but on her own view, she's undermining and destroying our culture, which, you know, Jerry Falwell and the religious conservatives hate these moral relativists. Like, you're undermining Western Christian, you know, capitalist culture, you know, you're undermining our society, you're corrupt. We don't want these people. If she's correct, we can't get past our empirical general generalizations. Then and societies are chaotic because everyone lives different, or whatever anybody does is morally right, right? Okay. So I hope you understand that line of reasoning because. She's idealizing uh, coherence in these little island communities. And yet she's actually working at this higher level of critical thinking, which has always been a Western value, incidentally. And so she's expecting Westerners to think at this level, but she's idealizing all these wonderful people over here with their coherence. But uh this what she's doing undermines all of that coherence like we don't have coherence we have gener you know one generation throws out the previous one because you're dated you know you don't know nothing uh does everybody understand that there is a kind of bigotry in that because in some ways she has she doesn't expect these people to think at a higher critical level, and she expects Americans to do that, right? And so there's a level, I mean, it's just completely incoherent. If you don't like cultural bigotry, then you, the people she's idealizing are cultural bigots. But when they do it, it's great because it means they're internally consistent. <laughs> Okay, um, Alicia, do you understand what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, I understand, but after listening to you explain, I think maybe I did not understand or I got the wrong idea because I thought she was saying that the culture that develops is because of choices that people make. Um, not just I don't like the culture the people develop the culture not the culture develops the people well it's a you know syndrome but um no they're not aware of choice they learn by imitation and habit right okay. and that's why it's so coherent yeah. is that they imitate each other but when you start being aware of choice and you start questioning. Uh, and then if you she brings in examples, not just, you know, they eat with chopsticks and we eat with silverware. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. Right. She deliberately picks things that we've been taught to think are wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So she's undermining our culture, right? Mm -hmm. And she's doing it deliberately. Yeah. Because she thinks somehow we're going to be better off for it but she does but she doesn't ask these other cultures to reconsider yeah right? and i mean that's kind of paternalistic right? if you value critical thinking it's very paternalistic to, oh you know pat them on the head aren't they cool but i mean i mean it's just and the other thing about it's just incoherent to me right bigotry is idealized here and it's demonized here. There's a reason for it because we've used our bigotry to oppress for imperialism, right? Colonialism. But it's one thing to just, it's just throwing out the baby with the bathwater to say that, um, therefore there's no, there's no morals. Um, because you can say it's wrong to exploit other people for their resources and slavery is wrong. You know, you don't, it's not morally indifferent. 
they actually have the same capacity for, remember the UN and Aristotelian capacities, like we all have the same capacities. And so the societies that she describes, it makes sense that they have adapted to their situation that way. And it does help them survive. That's what my paper gets to. Why do they do that? There's a reason. Mm -hmm. but, um, but like saving the yam seeds, you can get to the point where you can save your yam seeds without having to starve to death. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it's better if you learn more and change your ways and function better. But on the one hand, it's not completely arbitrary. On the other hand, learning how to think critically, learning how to get like the West could give them refrigerators or some, you know, some tech, higher tech things so they could save their yam seeds. They don't have to starve. And then they could change, but in a way that promotes the development of their capabilities, right? Yeah. But when we all we do is exploit people, it's not that it's morally relative, it's wrong. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I I hope that next on Monday everybody will understand because it's such a famous, it's so pervasive moral relativism, right? Yeah. So, um, so many people believe it. Yeah, that I don't know. There's yeah, there's so many people that think there is not a common moral thread like just because somebody lives in i don't know bangladesh their morals are going to be different but not any less correct right that's why i think the un yeah uh, has that capability model which yeah. again i i go back to aristotle because aristotle has we have to have a middle class and the art of statesmanship there's other stuff you can bring in once you get that model that the UN, I think, could use as further development. Um, also, it's nice for the UN to be able to say, you know, we didn't make this up in 1945. Like, what we're really working for is something that people have known for thousands of years. And we're trying to engage in the cultivation of an international middle class based on this. And that's what's new is that the extent to which we would like to, to spread this uh, economic system. And what's happened since 1945 is more and more radical self-destructive capitalism, unfortunately, it's winning out. I mean, there were ups and downs and good, good and bad stuff going on, but right at this moment, it's uh, pretty, self-destructive money sticking to money capitalism. Does that make sense, Alicia? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I wish we had more time to explain all that, but okay. And so again, feminism gets caught, women get caught in the middle of a much bigger